Good morning, everyone. Oh, sorry, you're talking, Richard? Okay, my bad. I'll let you talk a little bit more. You good? Oh, they're talking. Okay. Welcome to church. Um, sorry, collecting my thoughts here. Doesn't usually take very long, but anyway. Anybody old Gaither joke? The Mark Lowry doesn't take very long for Gaither to collect his thoughts because there isn't anything up there. You know what I'm talking about? That's what I thought. <laughs> it turned the computer on. <laughs> right. Okay. One uh, just uh, announcement this morning before we get started. Um, in your bulletin, there is a little insert. We as a church um, are going to be doing um, an outreach, I guess you might call it, around the Easter time. And you'll be like, you're already talking about Easter? What? But this is a little bit larger production that we're going to be doing, um, hopefully Friday and Saturday, so Good Friday and then the Saturday before Easter, kind of uh, for the church, but also as an outreach to the community. It's called The Living Last Supper. And basically, it's a play that is a recreation of that famous painting of The Last Supper. So there's, uh, we need people for acting in the actual production and then a couple, several other things that you can see listed on there. So if you're interested in helping out with that, please see Mike or I after the service. Um, we need 13 guys for this. So it's like, okay, if you are at all interested, come and talk to us. It's you, th you might think it's, oh, this huge, big, crazy thing to be up on the stage and acting. It's really not that hard. We're just basically going to be sitting at a table, and there's a short paragraph or two that each each disciple kind of talks about their perspective of of the, uh, of the Jesus and the, the events surrounding his passion. So if you're interested in all in that, please talk to me or Mike. We've already reached out to some of you, I know, um, but please see us afterwards and have that in mind. If you're... We also need, a lot, like I said, a lot of other things. So just because you're a lady doesn't mean you can't help. If you want to help, there's stuff here we, that you can do. So I want to bring your attention to that. Okay, uh, let's stand together this morning um, for the reading of the word of the Lord. I'm going to, as we uh, begin to worship together today. Psalm 34 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look, those who look to him are radiant and their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Turn to somebody next to you, say hello to him, say, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. bow our hearts together. Father in heaven, we give you thanks. We give you praise today for who you are. We give you thanks for your goodness to us. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And Father, we just thank you for the blessing of being upright, having the strength to be in this room today. Thank you for all those that are watching online today and 
the ability that we have to send church to places where people can't get out, where they may not be able to get up and come to this place, but we can still join together and have church together. We thank you for that. Just thank you for your many blessings to us. You are so good and so kind. This poor man cried and you heard our prayer. We thank you for your mercy and your grace today. And as we lift our voices in praise, we just ask that you would open our eyes to see you for who you are, that you open our hearts, that we would worship in spirit and in truth today. And we thank you. We give you praise for all these things. And all God's people said, Amen. sing of the Lord's goodness today. How good is he? Far beyond what eyes could ever see. He stands in front of me, how good is he? He paints a canvas with a million stars, yet still he holds my heart. Sing our Father.
in heaven the light of salvation oh how good is he the breath of almighty before and behind me oh how good is he how good is our god How good is he if he never did another thing for me? He is all I'll ever need. How good is he? If he's been good to you, why don't you give him praise today? Yeah.
lifted up, he defeated the grave, raised to life, our God is able, in his name we overcome.
Take a moment. Um, if you can think of a one or one word or a short phrase, of how the Lord has been good to you, just shout it out this morning. I'll start. Salvation. vision. Psalm 23, it says, Surely the goodness and mercy of the Lord will follow me all the days of my life. And I think sometimes we miss at every turn the goodness of the Lord. Like everywhere you turn, His goodness is there. There's always trials and there's always struggles, and sometimes His goodness is in those, but everywhere we go, the goodness of the Lord is following and pursuing after us. Amen. Can you say amen to that? Yeah. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you running after me. You can be seated this morning. Bow your heads with me. Father, we are thank, thankful for your goodness. Everything, with everything, for everything, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you that your goodness is pursuing after us. And as the psalmist said, I can go down into the depths of hell. I can go to the highest heaven. I can go to the far side of the sea. Still, you are there. And the apostle said, life, death, nakedness, peril, sword, tribulation, distress, nothing can separate me from your love, oh God. 
And so with thankful hearts and grateful hearts and tired hearts and beaten hearts, struggling hearts, we lift our thanksgiving to you today. And we encourage one another, singing to one another and singing to you our thankfulness and our praise. Our Father, the light of salvation, how good are you? How good are you to me, this poor man, this wretched sinner? We are so thankful today for your faithfulness, your truth. We're thankful for our family, our church family, health, strength, provision, faithfulness, all the things that we have all called out this morning and many more. Just pray, Father, that you would help us to walk in thankfulness and enjoy Even through our darkest hours, give us that joy, that peace that passes all understanding, the peace that doesn't make any sense to anyone but a believer in you. And so it is with thankful and grateful hearts that we bring requests to you this morning, things that are on our minds and our hearts. There are many things represented just in this room. Each person has many things that we need to bring before you and to lay at your feet, whether it's financial issues, health issues, emotional, spiritual, family members that are straying from you, friends that are far away from you. We just pray the light of salvation would shine on those individuals. Holy Spirit, that you would draw our friends, our family, that need you closer and closer to and bring them to salvation. I pray that you continue to work in us and sanctify us as believers to become closer and closer and become more like you in this world, that your kingdom might come in this world. We pray for those that have health issues that they have today. Some are at home watching online that they They can't even be up and be here in this room. Some of them are here in this room, and it's a miracle that they're here this morning. Some of us probably are just laying in bed wishing we could get another breath. And we pray for each individual for strength, for healing. It says in your word, Lord, that by your stripes we are healed. And all that came to see you, Lord, we're healed. So we come and we bow before you and we lay before you our our physical health struggles. And we say, Lord, here it is. We pray for healing. We pray for your supernatural touch. And until you bring that supernatural touch, whether it's now or in the future, we pray that you would give us the strength to glorify and magnify your name and have peace in the midst of it. We thank you, Lord, for your provision for us. As a church, you've blessed us so abundantly. As families, you've blessed us so abundantly. We just pray for continued provision. Lord, give us today our daily bread. Just pray that you would continue to provide for the needs of this congregation. pray for uh, the mental health of those in this church and our community. The wintertime can bring strange things, fog to our minds. It can bring depression. It can bring so many different things when it's dark and cold. And Just pray for the joy of the Lord to be our strength. Pray for our leaders in this nation politically from the national level, which is definitely has its tension right now. Pray for wisdom for those individuals that are working through international issues. Pray that they would turn towards you 
For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Pray for our local leaders as they try to make decisions regarding schools and closing and opening and in-person and not in-person and and businesses and lockdowns and all the things that we have struggled with for the last two years. Just pray for wisdom from your throne and that they would seek after you. Pray for the leadership in this church, that you would grow them in you, that you would grow them in unity with one another, that you would be with them as they lead and grow us and get, equip us for the work of the ministry. Give them just great wisdom and insight into your word as they bring the word to us. Give them great wisdom and insight in dealing with just the everyday logistics of caring for a congregation. It can be a heavy burden, Lord, and we just ask that they would cast the burden upon you for you will sustain them. And finally, Father, we thank you for your grace for saving sinners like us, for coming down, living among us, being tempted just as we are, suffering just as we do, and even more so, and dying on the cross to forgive us of our sins and to give us access to come before the throne of grace. We pray all this in the holy and the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. Does anybody have a uh, word of testimony they like to share today? Whether it's uh, another short thing that you're thankful for or a longer thing, or we'd love to hear it. Anybody have something they'd like to share today? And all the way in the back, we got a hand. Well, I don't know if everyone knows, but I know quite a few of you know. But, and I'm sorry if it's repetitive, but I could just shout it from the rooftops that Adoption Day is finally set for February 11th. Amen, sister. <laughs> Anybody else? This week, I was reading a story to Evelyn from Luke that I've read a lot, you know, I've heard it, and it's the story Jesus tells, and he's comparing a person who, a friend comes to visit him, and it's like the middle of the night, and he has nothing to give his friend, so he goes and asks his neighbor to provide some food, and, you know, this guy's sleeping in his bed, and he's he doesn't want to get up, but because of this guy's persistence, he will get up, not just because of their friendship, because of the persistence. And I've heard that, and I've thought of it as, you know, because sometimes in versions it's like importunity and persistence or boldness. And I was reading in the NIV this time, and it said, because of his shameless audacity. And it just struck me like, that is really that is some audacity to wake up and like start knocking on your neighbor's door at like one o'clock in the morning or something asking. And Jesus is comparing that and saying, you know, this is your father in heaven wants you to have this kind of it is shameless audacity, you know, for a human being to ask the creator of the world for something. And yet it's not just in inviting us to do that, it's commanding us to do that and I just have been in awe of that all week so I just wanted to share that with you that it's it is shameless audacity but it's just because of Jesus that we can have that kind of boldness to go to God and he cares that's good thank you I would encourage you as she mentioned we've been talking about being in scripture and reading different versions of scripture, I think, is really helpful. I mean, we all have our favorite that we like, and that's fine. But sometimes when you're reading, if you just do your devotions or read through the Bible in another version, it can kind of jog your mind like that, where you, something's worded just a little bit different, where it jumps out at you in a different way. It can be very helpful, so I would recommend that to you. Anybody else? 
Going once. Going twice. Okay, Mike, why don't you bring us the word? Well, this uh, this morning we're going to finish up our uh, series that we had here for uh, the month of January. And, oh yeah, any of the children need to be dismissed downstairs and head on down that way. Um, for this month we've been looking at a theme that's found in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter number three, and it's having to deal with this church that is at Sardis, and Jesus has some rather uh, interesting words for this church, and basically he's coming to them, talking with them, and telling them their problem, uh, which is basically they have this appearance of being alive, but yet really they're dead. And um, let's look at the scripture here. It says, Revelation 3, 1 through 3, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains, and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. And so for the last four weeks, we've been covering this theme about strengthening what remains and these are areas I believe in all of our Christian lives where if we're not careful we become very apathetic or complacent in our Christian life I know that that's happened several times in my life where I just kind of put it in neutral and just start to coast and you know not really advancing uh, pushing forward to the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus and really, this, this church here was a deceived church. They thought that they were alive, but really dead. And isn't it just like our Lord to really expose the truth? I mean, he, he really speaks into the situation and shows exactly what's going on. Even though this church, they had their reputation. I mean, it, it was probably well known uh, where they were at, uh, that this church was was the place, but yet Jesus tells them, you are really dead. Um, and so he tells them, you're not alive, but dead, wake up. And Jesus told this church to strengthen what remains is about to die. And so for the last four weeks, we've covered some important areas um, that always need reflection and growth, I believe. In our lives, we talked about confession, how important it is that we are confessing our sins, um, that we're not hiding from God, that we are actually confessing those sins before God, because he already knows what they are, uh, but we need to be confessing our sins. Uh, we talked about uh, how important it is uh, for our worship, that Jesus wants our hearts. And what is worship, right? Um, it's giving ourselves over to God, our whole body, everything, our whole heart over to God. Uh, then we talked about, uh, about listening and how well we listen and uh, what it means to listen and truth, listening to truth. That's what we, we talked about uh, last week, about the truth. And um, if you've noticed, all those four things uh, really have to deal with our relationship with God. Confession, um, our worship, listening, truth, all of those deal with our relationship with God. And so this week we're going to finish all this up, but it's going to have to deal more now with our relationship with one another, uh, forgiveness and loving one another, and um, how important that is. And if we were all to rate ourselves on a scale of 1 to 10 on how well we obey the biblical command to love one another and forgive one another, I would probably say that most of us would probably put down there probably a 7 or an 8. Uh, there might be some of us that might even venture to guess and say, 
yeah, I'm probably a 9 or a 10. I mean, nobody's perfect, right? But do we really consider what Jesus says when he says that we are to be loving one another? And uh, we also find in the scriptures about this idea of forgiveness, forgiving one another. And uh, so if we were to, if Jesus were to evaluate our love towards one another, uh, if he were to evaluate our forgiveness that we have uh, towards our brothers and sisters in Christ, would he agree with our rating? Or would he say to us, like he says to this church at Sardis, you have the appearance, you have the reputation of being alive, but really you're dead. Are we deceived? And so this is what I'd like for you to take away with you today. Do I love and forgive one another as Christ has? Do I love and forgive one another as Christ has? So let's take notice here uh, at some, uh, some text and uh, consider what Jesus has to say about this and if we are really strengthening what remains or if there's some areas in our life that we need to strengthen uh, what remains in matters of our love and forgiveness. So number one, love one another even as Jesus loved us. Here's the text here, John 13, 34 through 35. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. As members of the body of Christ, I want you to think about this. As members of the body of Christ, do we love one another? Now, before you start throwing in all the things that you can throw into that uh, equation, okay, such as, yeah, I like that individual, or yeah, we hang out, or we do this, or we do that. I'm not asking those questions. I'm asking, do you love one another. That's, that's the question we got to really answer. Do we have a love towards one another? Do we have love towards our brothers and sisters in Christ? Not just collectively here within Pleasant Ridge Christian Fellowship. What about our other brothers and sisters in Christ that aren't part of this fellowship? Do we have love towards one another? Notice Jesus' words here. Not just love one another, but did you see the fine print there? Look what he says here. Even as I loved you. Oh boy. Now that's really getting down to the nitty gritty, isn't it? Not just saying that we have love towards one another, but Jesus now really kind of sets the bar high now, doesn't he? And he says, not just saying I have love, like, oh, I love that person, I love them, or I love you, right? He says, even as I have loved you. Rarely, I believe, do we ever actually do this. I think sometimes we do, but often that is not the case. How do I know that? Well, because Jesus and Paul have to remind us to do this. Paul, in fact, reminds us in Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. I don't believe that any of us in here could ever reach the point in our life where we say, I've got that one down. Put it in the books. It's done. What's next? Right? No. No. Because this is something that we need to continue to strive for, that we are loving one another as Christ has loved us. Or even in the case of uh, with a marriage, husbands and wives, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. We never reach that point. And these are commands that we've got to keep working on. And so here's this church at Sardis. How did they score on their spiritual report card of loving one another? They had the reputation of being alive, but really they were dead. Notice in this text, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you. In what sense is Jesus' command a new commandment? 
I mean, after all, Leviticus 19.18 commands, you shall love your neighbor as what? Yourself. The entire Old Testament law is summed up by the two commandments. What are they? Love God and what? Love others. So how is Jesus' command new? I would say that Jesus' command here is the newness of Jesus' command is it's, the, it's a new, the standard that he gives is a new standard, even as I have loved you. It's not that Jesus is rewriting uh, scripture here or giving us something that's not there. He, what he's doing is he's, he's elevating that command to a higher standard, and he's really putting it there on the top. You see, Jesus' sacrificial love and going to the cross for us is, is the new standard. So the main idea of our text is fairly simple to state is what he's saying is, you are to love others just as I have loved you. And really, that's an impossible to live out consistently apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. And so this is really a good way for us to evaluate whether or not we know Jesus as our Savior is if we love one another just as Christ loved us. In fact, the book of 1 John deals a lot with that. He talks about our love towards one another. So exactly how did Jesus love us? Well, here's a few things. Number one, Jesus loved us by showing us how costly it was to love us. If we continue reading and we look at the context of what Jesus is talking here in John 13, he tells us here in verses uh, 31 and 32, he says, When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. This statement really takes us back uh, to John chapter 12, where after hearing that some of the Greeks were seeking him, Jesus says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And what is he talking about here? Well, he's talking about the fact that Jesus is referring to his death on the cross. That Jesus being put on a cross and dying the death that he died, he was going to be glorified. God was going to glorify his son. And in his death, Jesus was going to glorify the Father. On one level, the cross was the epitome of humiliation and shame. There was no worse way to die than to be stripped naked, to be flogged, and then nailed to a cross. And hung up to suffer a very slow death as a public spectacle. But in another superior sense, the cross was the epitome of glory both for the Father and the Son. And you see how costly Jesus' love is towards us? That he was willing to go to a cross to suffer the shame knowing the guilt, knowing all the, the things that were faced before him and that he would die for us. And so we have Jesus glorifying God and he magnifies the Father through his death on that cross. At the cross, God's love, his righteousness, his justice, his mercy and grace were magnified as at no other occasion in history. We read in Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth, or he showcased, he proved, he put on display his love for us in that while we were a sinner, yet sinners, still in the act of sinning, Christ died for us. See, it was at that cross that God's justice was upheld as his sinless son bore the awful penalty that his justice demanded for all sinners. But his love and his grace shined forth as he offered himself and he offered to us forgiveness, eternal life. 
to all who will repent of their sin and trust in Jesus alone. And so here in John 13, 32, he tells us if God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. And so Jesus here is talking about this this whole act of of what was going to happen, that he was going to die on the cross and he was going to die for us sinners. He was going to take our place on the cross and suffer God's wrath for us. But not only that, but then he was going to be resurrected from the grave. And he was going to ascend. And through all of that, his resurrection and his ascension, and God would be glorified in him. God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him immediately because of what Jesus did. You see, the resurrection was God's stamp of approval on Jesus' death. There's no other person in history that has ever died and been resurrected from the grave by himself. Only Jesus and Jesus alone has ever done that. And this was God's stamp of approval saying, yes, listen to my son. I have glorified him. All those that come unto him, he will in no wise cast out. Listen to Ephesians 1.21, it says, Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. You see, when Jesus, when Jesus resurrected from the grave and his ascension into heaven, it exalted him, again, to God's right hand. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so the point of all this is that Jesus' love, as seen at the cross, was very costly. We find this repeated often throughout Scripture. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Galatians 2, 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Ephesians 5, 2, walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Ephesians 5, 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. 1 John 3.16, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. You see, Jesus' love was a very costly love. And he proved that love. And this is Jesus' command to us. He says, love one another just as I have loved you. So what does that mean for me as a follower and a believer in Jesus Christ? What does that mean for you if you're a follower and believer in Jesus Christ? He tells us that we need to love one another just as Christ has loved us. That means love, loving one another, is going to cost us something. There's sacrifice that's involved on our part. Sacrificing for the sake of others. You know, when we think about Jesus going to the cross, it tells us in Hebrews 12, 2, that it was for the joy that was set before him that Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame. But then in Hebrews 2, 10, we read about the fact that it was through the cross that he would bring many sons to glory. And so our love towards one another is a, should be a costly love. It's, it involves sacrifice on our part. Are you willing to sacrifice something in your life for the good of somebody else, for the good of another fellow believer in Jesus? That's the kind of love that Jesus wants us to have. Here's a second thing about his love. Jesus loved by caring for others Look at John 13, 33. He says this, Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. 
Notice the language that he uses here. I love this. He calls them what? Little children. Have you seen that in anywhere else in Scripture? Book of 1 John, right? Here's, here's John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, right? It tells us this. Here's John. I think John got the point of all this because in his book, in 1 John, he uses that, that same phraseology, little children. It's the only other place that we find it in Scripture other than the Gospels there in 1 John. We see it in John chapter, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, verse number 12, verse 28. 1 John 3, 7, 1 John uh, 3, 18, 1 John 4, 4, 1 John 5, 21. This, this word there, it was a word of tender feelings, much as a father has towards his little children who need his help and protection. We also see Jesus expressing care for them because he knows that he'll be crucified and be taken from them. Because look what he says to them. He says, you will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now also I say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. He says, you're going to be looking for me. He says, I know that I'm going to be leaving here. I'm going to be departing. You're going to be looking for me. But he says, I want to tell you something. And later on, he does tell them. He tells them what is happening, what's going to happen, what's going to take place. There's care and concern for them. The point is is that Jesus' love was filled with tender feelings for his disciples. We later see this love lived out in Paul's words to the Thessalonians. He wrote this in 1 Thessalonians 2, 7 through 8. But we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but I love this, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. Can I ask you the question, and I ask this question of myself, is our love towards one another, just as Jesus' love, where we have a love where we're not just willing to say things to individuals, but we're willing to give of our lives also to other individuals, helping them with whatever it is that they need help with. That's the kind of love that Jesus wants us to have. Thirdly, since Jesus loved, since Jesus loved us, he can command us to do the same. Look here in John 13, 34. In going to the cross, Jesus was obeying the Father's commandment. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. How do we know that Jesus obeyed his Father? Because he went through with it, right? He obeyed the Father. What was that command in John chapter 10, 18? And so he commands his followers to love one another even as he has loved us. The fact that Jesus commands us to love one another means that you can do it. Did you know that God never gives us a command that we cannot follow? We can obey. We can do what Jesus wants us to do in loving God one another there's no excuses if you fail to love another believer you can't do it in your own strength of course you need the power of the holy spirit see this is the power of the resurrection of christ living in you that's what paul said right yet not i but christ right who lives in me and so it's relying upon the power of his spirit. It's dependence on the spirit's power is what Galatians 5, 16 uh, and verse 22 tells us. But just as Jesus obediently sacrificed himself to go to the cross for our salvation, so we are obediently and should be obediently to sacrifice ourselves for others for their ultimate good. Remember, love is not a feeling. I can't tell you how many times that I have sat with uh, couples, individuals that uh, were married and they were having marital problems, and they say things like this, well, I just don't feel like I love them anymore. Love is not a feeling. Love is an action. It's a verb. And in here, Jesus commands us to love one another. Not if you feel like it, he commands it to love 
one another. You see, we choose to love not because we feel like it, but because we are commanded to do it. Jesus' love towards us was based on obedience to his Father's command. Can you imagine if Jesus were to say, well, Father, I, I know you want me to do this, but I just don't feel like I want to do that. He didn't do that, did he? He followed through with what his Father asked him to do and to love and to give and to be uh, put on the cross for us. One of the early church fathers from the third century, uh, Jerome, so you've got to figure about this. So Jerome uh, lived uh, probably in the uh, uh, 300s. Um, it's noted of him in one of his works, uh, Jerome said this about the Apostle John. Okay, so you've got to figure, this is probably only about maybe 200 years uh, time, so I'm sure a lot of these stories were, were passed down as far as uh, what was said. But Jerome said this, when the Apostle John was in his extreme old age, he was so weak that he had to be carried into church meetings. At the end of the meeting, he would be helped to his feet to give a word of exhortation to the church. Invariably, he would repeat this, little children, let us love one another. The disciples began to grow weary of some of the same words every single time. And they finally asked him why he always said the same thing over and over. He replied this, because it is the Lord's commandment. And if this only is done, it is enough. John got the picture. John understood what it was to love one another. And that was like his mantra. That was something that he repeated often. Do we understand what it means to love one another as Jesus loved? Notice how this commandment is tied to our witness. Because look what he says here in verse number 35. Jesus says, by this, by what? By our preaching? No. By our worship? No. By our outreach? No. By the size of our building? No. By the size of our congregation? No. By what? He says, by this, he says, our love for one another, all people will know that you are my disciples. If we want to get real serious here about our witness towards the lost world, how is our love going with one another within our church? Do we love one another? Or is it the idea of, Hi. You know what he did to me? Do you know what you did to God? What did God do? He gave his son for you, sacrificed for your sins. By this, he says, Everybody will know that you're my disciples with your love towards one another. You see, he was talking about love that can be seen. It stems from the heart, but it's seen in outward actions that we have towards one another. It's the sort of love that stands out in this self-centered world. Do you love your fellow brother or sister in Christ? So how do I know if I'm loving like Jesus loved. Well, look at verses uh, 36 through 38, and I love the, the way that Jesus puts these things together here because he talks about loving one another, but then look at verse 36 and 38. He says, Simon Peter says to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Mm. Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. In fact, we read in the, in the gospel account uh, when Jesus is going to be uh, arrested it tells us that all the disciples forsook him and fled. Peter himself, here he's going, Lord, I'll lay my, down life, my life down for you. Oh, look how serious I am at following you, Lord. 
But the Lord knows, and he says, will you? Will you really lay your, down life, your life down for me, Peter? He says, no. He says, the rooster's going to crow. And he says, you, you will have denied me three times by then. Can I tell you something about all of this? Jesus knew about the failures of Peter and his disciples even before all of it even happened. He knew the failure of what was going to happen, what was going to take place. And he loved them to the end, and he showed that love by restoring them and using them even after his resurrection. Because if you read the, continually through the gospel accounts there, you'll see there when uh, the, the women uh, go there and they see Jesus resurrected, what is the first thing that they tell? They say, go tell who? Peter. Go tell Peter, right? Go tell Peter and the other disciples. You knew that Peter had some, some, probably some things going, man, I can't believe what I've done. It's true. Everything that he said was true. I let him down. And now here's after Jesus' resurrection, and the Lord does restore Peter, doesn't he? He uses him greatly on the day of Pentecost. Love means being committed to the other person's highest good. The highest good for all people is that they would become more like Jesus Christ by growing in holiness and living to glorify him. Are we seeking out the relationships that we have with others to go deeper, more than just weather and job talk? Okay? Meaning, are we seeking to be involved in everybody's lives, in, in the fact that we spend time with each other, getting to know them, and seeking out the highest good in that individual, helping them to grow and become more and more like Jesus Christ. That's what the body of Christ is supposed to be doing. So are we really loving people? All of us in here have had failures. There's no doubt about it. But are we seeking people out and seeking the good in them and trying to help them become more and more like Christ. That's loving like Jesus loved. So are we doing that? Here's the second thing. We'll finish all this up. Forgive as Christ has forgiven you. If we are loving one another, this second part I believe will go hand in hand because take a look at this passage in Ephesians uh, 4 and uh, 5 here. Ephesians 4, 32 through uh, chapter 5, verse 2. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. You see how forgiveness and love go together here? They are inseparable. Why? Because you cannot walk in love by holding bitterness, wrath, and anger. You cannot walk in love with clamor. That's loud shouting, shouting at other believers, you know, shouting at them, having these shouting matches. And by the way, this is all tied in also with in marriage, okay? Husbands, we cannot say that we really do love our lives when we're having shouting matches at our wives, right? Ah, well, fine, I said what I had to say, good. Sorry, you're not loving your wife, okay? You can't walk in, in love with having slander, saying untrue things about people to destroy their character or their name. You can't walk in love with having malice towards others. That's the desire to inflict injury, harm, or suffering on another because of a deep-seated meanness or spite. You see, those two cannot exist at the same time. This is why forgiveness is so powerful. The command here is to forgive as Christ has forgiven you. Do we, do we do that? Notice Paul did not write here, just forgive one another. Did you see the fine print again? What did he say? As for God gave you. See, when we think about that, God has given us an incredibly high standard to live up to when we have the opportunity to forgive someone. The great thing is that he gives us the grace and the guidance we need to imitate him by forgiving others as he has forgiven us. That's why he says in verse 1, therefore be imitators of God. 
See, Jesus has already paid off the ultimate debt for sin and established an account of abundant grace in your name. Listen to what Ephesians 1, 7 says. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our offenses according to the riches of his grace. You see, as we draw on that grace through faith day by day, you will find that you have all that you need to extend forgiveness for those who have wronged you. This is why I say that the gospel is so important that you're living it out every single day, that you're reminding yourself of the gospel every single day. Because if you forget, if you forget what God has done for you, if you forget that God has forgiven you an extreme amount of debt, that he has washed your sins away, that he has forgiven you and heaped upon you abundance of God's riches and grace, then you forget what it means to actually learn how to forgive others. And we need to be reminding ourselves of the gospel every single day. When I reflect upon what Christ has done for me on the cross and how God forgave me in Christ, this should motivate me to forgive others. Do you see how the gospel is and should be a part of our daily life here? When we repented of our sins, God forgave us. He released us from the penalty of being separated from him forever in the lake of fire. You were dead, is what Ephesians 2 tells us. You were dead. You were condemned and judged. You were guilty of breaking God's laws. But yet in all of that, he forgave you. Because you deserved it? No. But according to his mercy, he has saved us. Psalm 103, 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Psalm 133 through 4, If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. 1 Corinthians 13, 5, Love keeps no record of wrongs. Christ-like love is founded upon grace, not upon law. I would have to say that all of us in here are creatures of law. You say, what do you mean by that? Meaning that we have this idea of fairness set up in our minds that if, if an individual wrongs me, if an individual does something against me, if an individual says something against me, if, if they do something that, that harms me, does this, does that, does this, then I have every right to act the way that I act towards that individual. But that's not the way that the gospel works. Because that's not the way that God showed the gospel towards us. He forgave us. Not because we deserved it, but because of his grace and his mercy that he exercised towards us. You see, God has dealt with us in mercy. Titus 3, 5 through 6, it says he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. 1 Timothy 1 through 1, uh, 15, Paul talks about him being the chief among sinners. Did you know that you're the chief among sinners? You say, how do you know that? Well, because here's Paul who wrote a third of the New Testament, planted churches greatly used by God, saw Jesus himself, and he says that he was the chief among sinners. So where does that place us at? Whoa. <laughs> we have been shown great mercy. And in return, we need to show mercy and forgiveness towards others. Paul tells us here to be kind and tender-hearted toward those who wrong us and forgive rather than becoming bitter and angry. The person who has wronged me is just like me, a sinner in need of God's grace. So I need to be kind and forgiving towards him. So what about me? What about you? What about us, Pleasant Ridge Christian Fellowship? Are we obeying Christ's commands here to love as Christ has loved? Are we obeying Christ, the command to forgive as Christ has forgiven? Are we imitating Christ? Are we really alive? Are we just dead? Do we have the reputation of being alive, but really dead? Revelation 3 is to remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. 
What things in our lives do we need to remember what we have received and heard? Are we keeping them? Are we repenting of our false appearances? I pray that all of us in here would have a desire to love one another as Christ has loved and a desire to forgive one another as Christ has forgiven. Let's pray together. Lord, I do thank you for your word and I thank you for what it teaches us. Lord, I pray that we would have the desire to walk in love and that we would do exactly what your word commands us to do here. God, we cannot do this alone. We need the the help of the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray that we will walk in the Spirit and that we will have the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, faith, temperance. Um, May you just work in our lives. Lord, I pray if there's individuals in our lives that we know that we have not been loving towards, Lord, if there's individuals in our lives that we have not forgiven, that there is that, that tinge of bitterness that's in our hearts that we have towards another individual, I pray, Father, that we would forgive them. I pray that you bring individuals to our minds that um, we need to interact with more and to show the love of Christ more. I pray, Father, that you would enable these relationships to form among the body of believers here. We're grateful for your mercy towards us that has saved us and the grace that you have heaped upon us that we did not deserve. In the name of Jesus that we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mike. What a good, what a good challenging word this morning to remember to love one another. A couple of quick things uh, before we dismiss today. Uh, again, as you know, we're having our uh, fellowship meal after this and vision meeting, so we encourage you to stay for that. And also, the uh, Living Last Supper play, I uh, encourage you, if you are at all interested, to speak with me or Mike about that. We need, like I said, a lot of different things. We need props. We need people to help paint the backdrop. We need people to act. We need people to play music, um, usher guests, you know, when they come. So lots of different things, opportunities there. Also want to remind you, February calendars are available in the uh, fellowship hall. Pick one of those up to keep up, uh, keep track of what's going on. And speaking of the calendar, Joellen, could you come up here, please? Um, Joellen, as most of you, probably all of you know Joellen. If you don't, it's not her fault, it's yours. <laughs> but uh, she, is, she makes these calendars. She sets out all the refreshments before church. She has served this congregation uh, just relentlessly over the last, I don't know, 15 years or 20 years, however long it's been here. She's been here. Um, and I love Joellen, and she loves me. And <laughs> Anyway, we appreciate you all so much. And just recently, a couple weeks ago, I don't know if you know, but she retired. And so she, uh, <laughs> so we're just, we just want to say thank you to you. And she's probably going to be like kicking up her, her a notch around here since she doesn't have to work at a regular job anymore. So she may be seeing you all more often. Who knows? She may show up at your house and I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, we just want to thank her for her uh, service to the church and to the Lord and just celebrate with you your retirement. We do have a cake. Um, so if you're, not, uh, if you're not staying for the lunch and vision meeting, please grab a piece of cake. It's big. I don't want to take it home. So <laughs> please grab a piece of cake before you go. But we just want to thank you and uh, we just tell you, we appreciate you so, so much. So let's give her a hand and just thank Joella. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to dismiss you. We're going to get lunch ready, and then we'll have a prayer over that. So you are dismissed.